Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 2022 edition of the Health, uh, Community Board 2 Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee meeting. My name is Brandon Smith. I'm the chair of the Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee. Um, we're going to do introductions very quickly, but I'm going to go through some meeting protocol per our standard procedure beforehand. Um, so that you all know, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, this is for public access and archiving in accordance with the New York State Open Meetings Law. It's the practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members' cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave their cameras on, particularly if you are given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking. To maintain an appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you have questions that fall outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we will address them as time permits. You may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. We are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. If you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before any public meeting. Uh, we also ask that those speaking or presenting use plain language, speak at a moderate tone, and frequently ask if you're speaking loud enough. If presenting, and we'll do some of this tonight, re read the title of every slide and describe any images on the slide, such as photos, graphs, and charts. Um, before we go into the role, I just want to give my normal announcement that uh, we emphasize at all of our meetings a respectful atmosphere. What does that mean? It means regardless of whether you're a member of our committee, a member of the public, a presenter, a board member, everyone logged on to this Zoom and every Zoom that we have, there's an expectation that we treat each other, regardless of our title or status, as with, with respect. Um, if anyone is not being respectful, I will reserve the right to ask the board office to remove you from the meeting. Um, and I think we can move on from that point. Um, going forward to introduce the members of the committee. Uh, Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself first? Good evening, everyone. I'm Nicole McKnight. I am vice chair of the committee and also a board member. Excellent. Jessica? Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Thurston. I'm the secretary of the committee as well as of the uh, general board. Excellent. Lindsay. Hi, I'm a member of the committee board and the economic and employment committee as well. Excellent. Monique. Good evening, member of the board and of the committee. Thank you, Monique. We're also very honored to have several other board members here. Betty Feibush, hello. Hazar Ali, hello. And Latrell Masso, hello. Um, honored to have you present. And we'll definitely try to get you involved in our discussion. Betty, I know we got you presenting. Um, at this point, next up, we've got a, a motion for the agenda this evening. Um, before we, we make a motion, I'm just going to suggest several conditions we might want to have on that motion. One is that uh, two of the items on the original agenda, 63 Flushing and 1 Water Street, have informed the office they're not going to appear tonight. And I, I'd also like to suggest that we have a discussion about the, the health fair that we've been discussing under other business as part of our agenda. And I'll be covering Barry Newmark's section for uh, COVID-19 updates as I'm sorry to note that Barry's had to step away from the committee for a personal reason for a period of time, but our thoughts are with him. So with that, does anyone want to make a motion under those conditions for the agenda? Jessica, you have a second? A uh, second from Nicole. I second. Um, anyone who uh, abstains or, or uh, disapproves of that, please say so now. I don't see anyone, so the agenda is approved. Um, next, we've got the minutes of January 2022. Um, can I get a motion for the minutes of January 2022? 
Motion from Nicole. Second from anyone? Cobb. I second. Uh, let's see. I, I heard Cobb first, so that's that, yeah. that, that's Miss Cobb. Um, any uh, discussion or at, at this point, I, I would just ask, does anybody have any objection to uh, or abstention to approving the minutes from January of 2022? Okay. Um, excellent. Uh, we'll consider the minutes approved. I've seen we have another few committee members here. Ms. Cobb, do you wanna briefly introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Akosua Cobb, committee member. Thank you. Ms. Anadu? Hi, my name is Emily Anadu, a board and committee member. Great. Uh, Mr. Varela, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Alejandro Varela, uh, public member of this committee. Excellent. So very honored to have all of you and we can keep going with our agenda at this time. District level COVID-19 updates. Uh, forgive me, I'm gonna cover for Barry uh, tonight and uh, I'll, I'll do so at a high level given that I, I don't normally do this, but just so that we can have a brief discussion, uh, the citywide COVID-19 numbers, at least the new cases, as of yesterday, we're down to 1,988 with a seven day average of 4,268, which it appears to be um, nearing the, the bottom of a, of a decline that has been going on since about mid January, going back to about the level of new cases that we were at citywide from uh, the period of uh, pretty majority of 20. 21, uh, at least from April through November. Uh, deaths are, tra are, are, tracking, are tracking a little slower in that uh, they're declining, but the, uh, there were 149 deaths reported on February 1st with a seven day average of 102. Citywide vaccination rate is 87.7% one dose, 74.3% fully vaccinated. Then for our specific neighborhoods within community district two, I'm just gonna pull out some key statistics from what I was pull, able to pull from the city data by zip. 11201 uh, is, has still a relatively high transmission uh, of cases, 320 or so new cases per 100,000 people in the last seven days. The, um, the uh, case rate is higher than Brooklyn and New York City's case rate, but the death rate is lower than Brooklyn and New York City's case rate. The vaccination rate in 11201, which is downtown Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Heights area, 99% at least one dose, 99.9%, .9%, which is higher than the city and Brooklyn's vaccination rate. The next door zip is a familiar story to what we've heard in last, uh, in the most recent meetings, uh, 11205 Bedford-Stuyvesant, Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, which touches upon our district, has the same high transmission rate of cases. Uh, the, the death rate is lower than the city average and the Brooklyn average, but the vaccination rate, uh, at least one dose, is 64.19%, which every month we see an improvement, but it's um, a, a much lower number than the 99% for neighboring 11201. Um, the, uh, the other neighborhood that, uh, another neighborhood that we cover is Borum Hill Park Slope. Partially, we cover Borum Hill, uh, which also has a high transmission rate. Um, but looking at the, uh, the case rate, it's uh, higher than Brooklyn's case rate. Uh, higher than New York City's case rate. The vaccination rate is a little lower than Brooklyn Heights uh, and downtown Brooklyn, 85.2%, at least one dose, but it's, high, it's higher than the Brooklyn vaccination average of 76.86% and the New York City average of 84.47%. Final neighborhood, Clinton Hill Prospect Heights. The transmission rate is a little bit lower uh, 225 new cases per 100,000 people. The case rate is higher than the Brooklyn average though and the city average. The vaccination rate for 11238 
is 93.02%, at least one dose, which is a very higher vaccination rate than the Brooklyn and the citywide average. So I wanted to just spend a few minutes on that. It, I know our meeting tonight isn't going to be focused solely on COVID, and we have a lot of other things to agenda, but on the agenda. But does anybody have any one or two quick points they want to raise about these numbers, Ms. Anadu? Yeah, just one thing that um, we should probably figure out, not um, specifically on those numbers, but just in terms of COVID vaccinations all um, it, it overall. Like if I look at, for example, my Excelsior card, um, just, you know, the digital card from uh, New York State trying not been vaccinated, because it basically reflects that my card expires on the one year anniversary of my first dose. And given, so basically we're approaching a time when for some population, some like not insignificant percentage of people who are vaccinated will be approaching one year since it's been their first and second um, dose. So I just wonder if we need to be preparing for communications as much as we can through our district around what to do. Um, and do people need to get revaccinated after a year? What do boosters do? All of that. So, so again, not specifically about your numbers, but it just feels like we're at a, a time window where we need to start thinking about what happens for people you know, who have been where, where it's been a year since they've been had both shots. That's a really interesting point, Emily. I, I, I think that's something that we should think about. And perhaps um, we can we can think about how we can structure a meeting conversation or, or maybe um, the, the best communication with the uh, Department of Health, maybe in the follow up from last month's meeting to um, ensure that we are we're facilitating getting the right message out. To our, our community. Um, Ms. Einhorn, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, just following up on Emily's comment. Um, so there's a new um, piece of the app that you have to download called Excelsior, um, Excelsior Plus. Pass Plus. Plus. Mm -hmm. um, and your boosters information, once you download that, they're going to start to sync data apparently. It hasn't been done already. Um, so there's more information coming, but the state is, is planning for that. It's not a of course, a city operation, but the state is working on that. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for raising that. That's a good point. If only they could get my booster to upload into their app. It just isn't working. I, I don't I don't know why, but it's a technic technical thing. Any other questions or thoughts on uh, on on the COVID-19 from either the board uh, committee or the public? All right, we can also touch on this in other business too, because we're going to be discussing some health related topics in that portion. Um, let's move on to our presentations for tonight's meeting. I see we do have Mr. Day here. Do we have Mr. Day? I, I saw, but do we have you in voice yep. and video? Yep, I'm here. Hopefully, can you hear Wonderful. me? Wonderful. Okay? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I am really grateful to have you here for this presentation uh, on behalf of uh, New York City Department of Sanitation. We're excited to hear about curbside composting. We we'll just ask you and, and our other presenters, if you can try to keep your presentation to around 10 minutes, that would be great. And then we'll, we'll have some Q&A after uh, both of the presentations. Okay, great. I was given a little bit of a longer timeline to expect, so I will try and keep it brief. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Richard Day. I'm a, an outreach coordinator on the curbside composting team at the Department of Sanitation. Uh, I was asked to give a, an overview of curbside composting um, and go into some of the challenges that we face uh, with the service. Um, so I'm going to do that. Okay. Um, great. So, yep. I'll, first, I'll touch on the background so that we all are on the same page about what curbside composting is. I'll talk about service a bit, and then I'll get into the challenges to wrap things up. So firstly, hopefully you all know, but if you don't, um, what is curbside composting? Well, at its core, it's a free voluntary service provided by the Department of Sanitation to recycle your food scraps and yard waste. So essentially we provide you with um, a, a bin to collect these materials and then we service it on a weekly basis. Uh, the materials brought to our different facilities for processing where it's turned into compost, which is a, a soil amendment um, or clean energy. Um, as far as why you should compost, like why the heck would I want to do that, right? 
Uh, that's because food scraps, food cell paper, and yard waste actually comprise a third of all the trash that New Yorkers throw out. Um, so our waste characterization study in 2017 showed that 34% of all material um, is actually uh, that gets thrown out in New York City is actually compostable. Uh, when you take into account the fact that we uh, throw out 12,000 tons of material a day, uh, that's a lot that we can actually be diverting from landfill and putting to a productive reuse. Uh, so by composting your food scraps, you're actually helping us to keep your neighborhood clean and healthy. So you're helping to reduce rodents and pests. Your food scraps are inside of our secure brown bins um, that are really difficult to get into instead of those black garbage bags that are really easily torn open. Um, and so that means that rodents and pests can't get to it, right? And if they can't get to it, then they're not spreading that litter out all over your sidewalk. So you're actually helping to reduce street litter as well. Um, uh, another impact that you're having by composting is you're actually helping to make New York City more self-sufficient and more resilient. Uh, so we're not sending as much waste to landfill. So we're not paying to you know, truck or barge or, or put things on a rail out uh, and sit in landfill to decompose and uh, release methane, which harms the environment. We're actually using this material to create compost, which goes to beautify you know, your neighborhood or even your own personal plants, um, and also create clean energy um, at facilities like you see uh, on the bottom right, Newtown Creek. Uh, if you're all familiar with there, the big digester eggs can actually uh, produce um, a gas, which we can then harness and, and use to power, for power homes. Um, as far as what actually goes in the bin, that's any food scraps, any food sold paper, and leaf and yard waste. So that means fresh food, spoiled food, meat, bones, dairy, products can all go into your brown bin. Um, food sold paper means paper plates, paper napkins, coffee filters, tea bags, even dirty pizza boxes can go into your brown bin. And leaf and yard waste, I think, is pretty self explanatory. If you have a backyard, if you've got some house plants, you use some trimming or something like that, you can put that material into your brown bin as well. There's no need to separate any of this material. Uh, they can all go into the same bin because they're all going to become the same thing in the end. Uh, just to take things one step further, um, it's actually okay about, you know, uh, about what can actually can and can't go into the brown bin. It's actually okay to put plastic bags into your brown bin. Um, I know a lot of our previous messaging has said that you can't do that. Even the bins themselves have little decals on them that say you can't put plastic bags in them. That's outdated information. Sorry for the confusion. Um, all of our processing facilities actually have machinery that can separate out your compostable waste from those plastic bags. So there's no need to worry about contamination. Uh, any BPI approved compostable items, you know, like plates, um, cutlery, even some cups, um, as long as they say BPI approved on them, they can go into your brown bin as well. Uh, things that are not okay include diapers, any hygienic products, animal waste, wrappers, packaging, foam, metal glass, plastic recycling. Really just try and stick to those, the, the food cell paper, or sorry, food, food cell paper, and leaf and yard waste, and we'll be okay. Uh, participation itself is actually really simple. You separate out these materials, you put them into your brown bin for collection, you put your brown bin out onto the curb. So it's just like any other recycling program. Like you would have a, a glass bottle, for instance, you'd take that glass bottle, put it into your metal glass plastic recycling, put that onto the curb. Same idea. We don't need you to create, you know, a compost pile in your backyard or, a, a, you know, a three bin system or anything like that. We want the material so that we can do the hard work. So it's a pretty straightforward, um, more or less hands-off program for you. All right, so now that we've got that sort of background, just wanna to touch, on, touch on service really quickly. Um, so collection was suspended in 2020 uh, due to the pandemic, um, there were budget cuts, um, but it actually was uh, brought back in October of last year. And that's when we started rolling out our first trucks again, um, near neighbors to the South, uh, got our first ones um, in Brooklyn Six. Um, and we, we brought it back with a new model. So this new model um, requires all buildings to sign up for service, even if they had it in the past. Um, and there's two main reasons for that. One is that we want to understand um, where participation is in this program. Um, you know, who wants to participate, right? And where they are. Um, and then also we want to be able to communicate with you about any um, updates or changes or, or anything related to the program. So um, we had a lot of snow events this last you know, week or two. Uh, and so we've been able to communicate in a way that we haven't ever been able to before. We can actually let you know, hey, uh, you know, with an email or a text message, sorry, there's delays due to ongoing snow operations, for instance. So, um, so that's been huge for us as well. Um, and you can actually sign up by going to 
nyc.gov slash curbside composting or by calling 311 uh, if you aren't computer literate or you'd prefer to do it over the phone for any reason. Um, the service areas are the same as they were before uh, the previous suspension, before the suspension. So it's the same 44 community boards uh, that previously had access to curbside composting that are eligible to get it again if enough buildings sign up. Um, so that includes all of Manhattan and the Bronx and large parts of Brooklyn and Queens, and then a section on Staten Island, like you can see on this map, highlighted by those orange areas. Um, if you know folks in those yellow or beige areas, whatever you want to call that color, um, we still encourage you to sign up because that helps us to understand where demand is and where we should expand um, or focus our efforts next. Um, but at this moment, you're not able to actually um, get curbside composting for your building there. Um, and so as part of those efforts that we were able to direct, um, we're working to add more food scrap drop-off sites um, you know, in those community boards so that even if you don't have that um, curbside you know, for your own building, you at least have more options to compost in your neighborhood. So you can go to myc.gov slash drop food scraps to actually find uh, a great map of all those food scrap drop-off locations, of which there are over 200 at this point. Uh, as far as neighborhoods with service go, though, uh, we are currently operating in seven uh, community boards. Um, so Brooklyn or Bronx Community Board 8, Brooklyn Community Boards 1, 2, 6, and 7, and the Manhattan Community Boards 6 and 7. So it's a pretty short list. Uh, you guys made the cut. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to be talking to you and not some of the other community boards. Um, and I'll talk about that again in just a second. Uh, so basically how this works is that we notify folks uh, when they're, they're going to be getting service in their neighborhood or really when they're getting service in their building. We make sure that they have all the materials and um, you know, support that they need in order to actually participate. And then before collection begins, and then just like your regular trash and recycling, we collect everything on a weekly basis. So it's a once a week collection. And we do ask that, or we do require that participants use our brown bins um, when they want to participate in this program. All right, so when will service start? So uh, as I mentioned, starting in October, uh, we started adding service in community boards uh, where we've reached a sufficient number of signups. Um, sufficient is uh, sort of this funny term uh, because we don't have a magic number, right? It's not, hey, get your community board to a thousand signups so we can get you service. It's sort of a more malleable thing. And it's really based on um, housing stock, housing density, anticipated tonnage, and things like that. So we can't really say like, hey, uh, Brooklyn 10, you need 500 more signups to get to this point. So it's based on a number of factors, OK? Um, but we'll notify you when you've been added to a collection route and let you know what your actual service start date is. Uh, if the community board hasn't had enough signups, but you signed up, you're going to be placed on a wait list. We'll let you know, sorry, you don't have enough signups at this time. We're working on it, and we'll let you know when that changes. Um, but we do want to provide everyone with with, with this service, right? We were in 44 districts before, now we're only in seven. We want to get back to where we were. We you want to get past where we were. Um, so we encourage you to, to sign up if you haven't already and encourage you to get your friend, family, and anyone else to sign up as well. Uh, we're doing what we can. We need some help and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, but before your building or your neighborhood has service, uh, we still want you to compost. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a backyard and you really want to get to it, great more power to you. Uh, we're actually bringing back our master composter course this spring, so maybe you're interested in that. Um, but otherwise, uh, most people are going to compost using our uh, food scrap drop-off sites, which I mentioned before. So again, you go to nyc.gov slash drop food scraps. You see this wonderful map with over these, you know, over 200 of these green dots, uh, each with their own hours of operation. Uh, you know, it, sorry, the green dots signify a, a food scrap drop-off location. Um, so if you click on them, you will see their hours of operation and the materials that they accept. Um, if there aren't any drop-off sites near you, or if you want to open up your own, you can go to on.nyc.gov slash host a drop-off, fill out a form, we'll get in touch with you and make sure that you have the resources and materials that you need in order to actually um, operate one of these sites. Um, so I just wanted to make you all aware of that in case you feel like uh, you need more food scrap drop-off sites in your neighborhood. I think you've got three that I'm aware of, um, so maybe there's room for more. All right, and now to the challenges. Um, I'm just going to look kind of short, but that doesn't mean they're easy. Um, so some of the main challenges that we're facing on our way uh, or with this program, uh, part of them on the way to um, further expansion. Number one, 
there's confusion and misconceptions about the program. I can come out here and give the same spiel millions of times, but um, people are still going to be confused <laughs> or if they don't hear it or they're still going to have misconceptions. Uh, the most common one being, you know, like, isn't this going to attract rats? Um, so that's, that's our main challenge. I'll talk about that in the next slide, actually. Um, so the main challenge would be uh, confusion and misconceptions around this program. Um, how you can help with that individually or as a community board, just talk to people um, or direct them to us. We do have, we are starting up um, a sort of volunteer arm of our work. Um, if you want to go to one of our orientations and learn what you can do as an individual, that'd be great. Go to makecompost.nyc slash volunteer. I can drop links in the chat afterwards, um, but really just talking to people, getting them more comfortable with the idea of the program is huge. Um, another challenge that we face is a lack of documented interest. And that's kind of a funny thing to say. Um, we know that there's interest out there. We know that people do want to compost. It's just, we need to see those numbers and we need, and how we do that is through these signups, right? Um, so maybe Brooklyn 10, you know, 90% of the residents there do want to compost. But uh, if we're only seeing like this meager number, you know, we're probably not going to go there next. Um, so really, really just encourage your friends, family, and anyone else, you know, to actually sign their building up. Um, that's going to go a long way for us. That's, that's what we really need help with. Um, and the last major challenge um, that I'll talk about is um, this little lack of resources. Um, so what we've done this far is what we've been able to do <laughs> uh, with what we've been given to us. So um, as I mentioned before, we were in 44 districts previously. Now we're in seven, you know, we're working our way back uh, to where we were, um, but it's a process, right? Um, and so how you and the board can help is you can just continue to advocate for service, um, you know, in your district or your borough or citywide. Um, and that'll go a long way um, to helping us get back to where we were, or where we want to be um, is really it. Um, so those are the three challenges. I'm sure folks will have a lot of questions about that. Um, but I also just included some of our common misconceptions just to clear the air around some of these things before I did uh, hop off my soapbox. Um, the first misconception being that composting attracts rats and other pests. Um, and the fact of the matter is that it really doesn't. Um, if you're using our brown bin properly, it can actually help to reduce rodent activity. As I mentioned, where you're, you're making your food scraps less accessible um, to those sorts of pests um, by not placing it in those really easily um, torn open uh, black garbage bags. So you're actually, you can actually help to reduce that activity within your building and your neighborhood. Um, a lot of people think that composting is complicated. Um, it's not, like I said, we're not asking you to create a, a windrow or anything in your backyard. We just want you to put your food scraps, food toilet paper, and yard waste into our brown bin. Um, a little slogan that can help if you're new to composting is if it grows, it goes. You know, fruits and veggies, those sorts of things grow and they can go into your brown bin. Doesn't work as well with like a paper plate, but uh, you know, just getting you there. Um, a lot of people think that you can't compost meat, bones, or dairy products. Um, and that's true with a lot of our food scrap drop-off sites. Um, but with the brown bin, we're more than happy to accept all those materials. Um, we operate on such large scales that we don't have any trouble processing them. Um, this one I went over, but a lot of people think you can't put plastic bags in your brown bin. You can. Our facilities have machinery that can separate that out. No problem. So if that's how you choose to participate, that's a okay. Um, and this last one, sorry, this is actually taken from my webinar that I give on a weekly basis in case anyone's interested. Uh, the last thing is most compost gets thrown out when people come to me and they think this is the case. Um, and it doesn't. Um, part of the, sometimes this comes from um, seeing these same white trucks go down your block and collecting your trash or collecting your recycling or collecting your compost. All of our trucks look the same. Um, and some of them even have a split body or split back. So they might throw, you know, they might place one material on one side and one on the other. So maybe that gets confusing sometimes. Um, but we want your compost, compostable material. We wanna be able to turn it into compost. You know, We wouldn't be going through all of this effort, getting people to sign up, doing, uh, you know, coming out to community boards, doing webinars, doing all this outreach if we were just gonna throw this stuff out. So um, please rest assured, we want your compost so we can compost it. It's not going anywhere else, okay? Um, but just before I go, I just want to leave these up on the screen as well. If you want, need, want any more information about composting, go to nyc.gov slash curbside composting. We also have this volunteer link, makecompost.myc slash volunteer, and I'll throw everything in the chat too. 
That, that's great. Thank you so much, Mr. Day. Um, I know we'll have some questions in a bit, but for the sake of time and having a very busy schedule and a whole slew of liquor licenses later, I want to allow Brooklyn Swab, who we're really excited to have here, to give their presentation as well. And just like I did with Mr. Day, I'll give you some leeway, but if you can try to keep your presentation around 10 minutes also, that would be great. Um, and uh, Ms. Feibush, and do, do we have your your your, uh, yes, your Elizabeth question. Rossman is here. Wonderful. I'm so honored to have both of you and whoever would like to take the lead, feel free to do that. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Elizabeth Rossman and I are members of Brooklyn Swab. Uh, many of you know me because I've been a member of the board for a while. Um, and we will be telling you uh, about the swab, what we do and how you can uh, work with us as, as advocates for uh, policy in general and specifically around issues as they come up. Uh, and uh, we want to engage in a conversation about what this looks like on the ground in our district, what's happening that you all who live or work in our community uh, can share. And we're especially interested in the uh, NYCHA developments because uh, Mr. Day talked about the curbside and, and so on. That isn't established for the NYCHA and many people live there. And what are the options for them? What are some of the pilot projects and things that we as, as a committee and as a board can advocate for in our district statement of needs? So, uh, Elizabeth uh, will talk about, will present the PowerPoint, and I will help facilitate the conversation afterwards. So, Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. Um, I trust you see the screen. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, oops, sorry about that. I am going to minimize this. I hope you could see everything. Um, my name is Elizabeth Roseman, and I'm a member of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board along with Betty. Um, so to continue the conversation about waste uh, that Richard, Richard started, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do. Some of you may be familiar with the zero by 30 logo. This represents the New York City's goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. Um, and considering the major um, problems we have with waste. That's a pretty lofty goal that I think has actually been pushed back in time now. Um, so in order for us to send less waste to landfills with the ultimate goal of zero waste, uh, we need to address um, our environmental justice issues, uh, our recycling rates, uh, pollution, um, and the cost. So um, some neighborhoods pay um, have a pay a disproportionate uh, cost of our current waste practices. Uh, for example, community board one, uh, there's um, 19 waste transfer stations located uh, just in that district, which is 30% um, of all waste transfer stations in New York. Um, and as you can imagine, that leads to more air pollution, truck traffic and worse health outcomes for residents. Um, we also need to increase our recycling rates. Um, as um, Richard mentioned, uh, we throw away uh, a lot of what we could recycle. Um, this is the pie chart that he was mentioning from the waste characterization study. About a, a third of what we throw away in black trash bags is recyclable metal, glass, plastic, and paper. Um, another third is organic waste, so food scraps and yard waste that could be composted. Another 9% is um, electronics, clothing, um, household items. So there's only really 23% of everything in our black trash bags that um, is really trash. So we could reduce our trash by up to 80%. Um, in addition to landfilling, we also um, incinerate our trash um, and that um, contributes to carbon emissions and to toxic uh, chemicals in our air that we all breathe. 
and the city also spends um, upwards of $430 million exporting our waste to other states. So the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board is a volunteer um, organization. Um, it's made up of industry professionals, concerned citizens, and everybody in between. Um, we host monthly meetings and have speakers come and talk to us about um, different topics. Uh, we meet uh, the first Monday of the month. So we're actually meeting next Monday and we're having um, Sandy Nurse come and speak to us. She's a new city council member who is also now the head of the sanitation committee um, at city council. Uh, so our goal is to educate um, the borough president and elected officials regarding waste and environmental issues. So we do our best to educate ourselves and others. Um, and anybody is welcome to participate in our meetings. Uh, we used to meet at Brooklyn Borough Hall, but now we meet via Zoom. Uh, we have multiple committees. Um, and the beauty of Brooklyn Swab is anybody can be a guest or come and become a member and whatever waste issue that keeps you up at night, you can work on it. Uh, we host multiple events. Um, we recently hosted an event uh, regarding waste equity, social and environmental justice. We've also held um, events about plastic pollution, organic waste, um, and it's free and open to all. Um, our legislative committee also testifies <coughs> at public hearings. We recently testified at um, a bill called a uh, hearing for the bill called Skip the Stuff. Um, the bill would require restaurants to provide single use items like utensils and condiments only on request. So this would help to cut down unnecessary single use plastic. Uh, we are also part of coalitions, uh, including uh, the Save Our Compost Coalition. So as Richard had mentioned, um, when all organic funding was cut at the start of the pandemic, the Save Our Compost Coalition um, fought to bring back some funding and $3 million was returned for FY21 um, to bring back food scrap drop-off sites like the ones you have um, at Borough Hall and um, at the Ford Green Park. Um, so that was a big win. Um, we wanna know what your uh, top waste issues are. Um, is it issues related to waste management at NYCHA, um, density, uh, waste issues regarding new development? Uh, we're gonna get to that part. Uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, innovative waste management solutions that we've heard about. Uh, there are some great nonprofit organizations um, working to advance um, sustainability and recycling uh, at NYCHA with job creation for young people at its core. Um, inner, inner City Green Team um, was founded by Bridget Vicente here. Um, and she's working to create a uh, recycling infrastructure at NYCHA. Um, NYCHA actually did not have um, recycling collection that we all take for granted up on, you know, uh, until recently when there was um, a threat of a lawsuit. Um, and her organization has a two-year contract at uh, the Wagner Houses in East Harlem uh, doing a uh, door-to-door uh, a door-to-door -door recycling program and also doing education at, around recycling and composting. Uh, the program started in July of 2021 and they've signed up 300 households to date. That's about 12% of residents at the Wagner houses. Um, they also partner with the mayor's action plan for community for neighborhood safety. Um, to utilize the recently founded New York City Cleanup Corps as their workforce. Um, another organization uh, is Green City Forest. They're pictured at the bottom of the slide. Um, it, 
It is an AmeriCorps green jobs program for our young NYCHA residents. Um, green City Force runs urban farms at five NYCHA developments. They host farmers markets and uh, food scrap drop-off sites. Um, they recruit service members from um, all NYCHA complexes, including the Ingersoll houses uh, in District 2. And they also partner with the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety for street beautification projects. Um, and Gre Green City Forest has data that has shown um, an urban farm and a housing development has shown to reduce crime rates. So there's many uh, social benefits aside from the obvious of teaching kids to connect with the earth uh, and grow food. And the last organization I wanna mention is Compost Tower. Uh, Domingo Morales is pictured here. Uh, he builds compost sites um, at NYCHA complexes. Uh, he teams with Green City Force. Uh, I also want to mention some upcoming legislation that may um, bring big change to our waste management practices. As I mentioned, um, the Skip the Stuff Bill, which is on the New York City level, uh, but statewide there's consideration to um, expand the bottle bill. So the bottle bill is turning 40 years old in 2022, like me. <laughs> and um, the bottle bill has been has proven to be very effective at increasing recycling rates. Uh, bottle redemption rates are 60 to 70 percent, whereas residential recycling rates are only at 15 percent. So uh, the expanded bill would build upon that success and would include additional types of beverage containers and increase the deposit from a nickel to a dime. Um, other states like Michigan and Oregon that have increased the deposit have seen their recycling rates go up. Um, another bill that's coming up is the uh, extended producer responsibility bill. Um, basically it would um, make it law that manufacturers would contribute to the cost of managing the end of life of their products packaging. Currently that burden as on taxpayers and municipalities. So EPR would help to provide funding uh, for municipal recycling programs. Also, uh, just quickly, um, this is, uh, I've zoomed in on the map that Richard's shown. These are the three food scrap drop-off sites in the district. Also, um, these are the textile drop-off sites. Uh, New York City also has a program called Refashion for buildings with 10 units or more. They could request um, a clothing bin, um, such as the one pictured here. Um, and also for e-waste, there's a similar program called e-cycle where buildings with 10 units or more can request a bin to hold the e-waste until it gets picked up. Uh, there is also every borough has a drop off site for hazardous materials like paint, thermometers, batteries. Um, and then as we wrap up, just this is a uh, comparison of how uh, Community Board 2 compares with other districts in terms of recycling rates for metal, glass, paper, and plastic. Uh, you are 18% higher than the city average, but not as high as um, Community Board 6. So thank you for listening. These are some of the ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, to attend our meeting, uh, go to our website uh, and to the calendar, you can click on the calendar link and there's a Zoom registration link uh, or you can follow us on social media. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you, Betty, for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was gonna, uh, have a little time for to engage the committee in a discussion about this, or is this for another time tonight? Well, we can have a we can have a discussion about this, but I also want to open up the floor for questions for Mr. Day as well, too. Um, I I think, given the the time and the extent of the presentation, we have maybe about 15, 20 minutes that we can uh, we can give to Q and A and. 
I, I would just ask for everyone's benefit if we can just all agree to keep our questions to about one to two minutes at most. And if we can keep the answers to about one to two minutes at most too, then we'll get everybody in and we'll have a great experience. Um, it, both of you, uh, all of you, great presentation. Thank you so much. And I hope that you'll be able to share the slide deck with us perhaps at the end of the, the meeting uh, so, or with the board office so that we, we can at least uh, have the information and, and people can look at it at their own leisure. This, Mr. Day, I just wanted to ask you with regard to Department of Sanitation, could you just briefly, I don't expect you to fully answer this, but briefly speak to what the plan is to, to get to a zero waste world from Department of Sanitation's perspective shortly in a manner where, you know, I, I've seen conversations about mandatory composting, but how do we do that where people are, um, uh, where it costs a lot of money to maybe for some people to, to have to live in a, in a zero waste world. You know, I, I, I see both sides of that and wanted to just hear what your perspective was. Yeah, so sorry, I'm a little insular in my role and I'm looking at, you know, concentrating on my particular aspect of this, you know, how we're getting compost to the rest of the city. Um, that's, that's what I'm working on personally. Uh, my colleague Teresa might be able to speak more broadly to that. Um, but you know we're we're doing what we can with our with our different initiatives. You know, as um, the folks from BK Swab mentioned, we've got uh, curbside composting, we've got refresh, we've got e-cycle. We're really trying to do our best to whittle down um, that uh, you know those different waste streams until you know they're actually going where they can be reused or or redirected or whatever the case is instead of just thrown out. Um, and there's a lot of education that has to go along with that because people don't understand you know why it's bad to throw this out or, or you know what they can do with like the, this old um, apple core or something like that um, so there's definitely a lot of education that needs to happen before um, we can get to that point uh, Teresa, did you I, I would also <laughs> yeah I would also add that our new mayor is very interested in uh, the climate change and sustainability uh, in you know greener living uh, we know he's a vegan, but he's looking at the connections between urban farms, for example, in NYCHA to reducing crime rates. So there's a lot of connection. Uh, we need employment, right, uh, for disengaged young people and out of work people. We need to uh, bring the business community in with high tech, high tech solutions as well. Uh, and, and of course, we need to engage with young people. So that I, I believe that this can come together uh, more forcefully in, in the current administration uh, and with so many advocates. And a lot of the ad advocacy that's happening is happening in NYCHA. So uh, I'm hoping in this audience tonight, is there someone who's familiar with NYCHA or lives in NYCHA or works that can talk to some of their issues in Ingersoll, Whitman, Farragut. Yes, I, I hope it will get to that. Thank you, Betty. But I think Mr. Day was referencing his colleague, Ms. Cunningham, who's on the line here. And Ms. Cunningham, did you have anything that you wanted to briefly add to Mr. Day's point? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa. I work with uh, community affairs at the Department of Sanitation. Um, and yeah, actually, you know, Richard pretty much said it all. Um, I think that we are, you know, hyper focused on how we can divert waste as, you know, effectively, efficiently as we can into the different, um, you know, areas so that we're not sending things to landfills. Um, also, community partnerships, which is what I think. Um, Betty was mentioning, like, we rely heavily on the public's cooperation, the, co the public's interest, um, residents to, you know, team up with us. I mean, even though recycling has been the law for, you know, more than 30 years, we still have people that struggle to, you know, recycle efficiently. So just trying to, um, you know, sure that up and get as many people educated and answer as many questions as we possibly can, um, just to smooth that process, I think, is um, where we are right now. Great, thanks. I, I see we have two committee members with their hands up, three, and I, I wanna make sure we get the questions from the committees in. Uh, Ms. Thurston, your, your hand was first. You have the floor. Thanks, Brandon. Um, this is awesome. I am really excited for us to support this in any way that we can. 
thank you for sharing those bills in particular. I think we can, um, well, they're in a minute. Um, so my, my question is mostly for Richard and for Ms. Cunningham, and it's about, is there a role, and I'm, I'm putting my other hat on as I lead sustainability for a very large corporation that's based in Manhattan, and is there an opportunity for corporations to help with this? I know that might be a different part um, of sanitation, and so perhaps we could follow up after, but I just wonder if there's a role corporations can play to be like real, real advocates in this because composting doesn't really happen in massive office buildings as much as it certainly could. Um, so I'm curious if that's part of this work at all. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and touch on that and I'm not sure if Therese will have anything to add, but um, there's definitely opportunity for, uh, for uh, corporations to do this. Um, unfortunately, uh, at least with regards to composting, it is not through the Department of Sanitation since we don't service um, like uh, right. businesses. Right. Um, but certain businesses are required to compost their materials if they're above a certain square footage or if they have a certain number of locations. Um, but that service is available to businesses as well. You know, you're paying someone to take your trash. You can pay someone to take your compost yeah. um, as well. So that's that's where I would go with that. Um, I agree. I can oh. add, if I can add to that. Yeah. Uh, Offices create a lot of paper, at least they used to when I worked in offices, maybe they don't as much, but paper is a, is a commodity that that's recycled and there's a company that makes them into pizza boxes. So most of your pizza boxes are from paper that was collected from office buildings. Cool. Well, I think that's great. I'll just say if there's ever an opportunity for, I know sanitation doesn't service commercial spaces, but like an ambassador program, almost like the mayor's table, whatever we call that, that like we're members of, that other big companies are members of. I just say, I would just suggest to think about it because you should hold folks like us accountable to lead in that way. I just wanted to quickly mention too, yeah. um, I definitely think there's there's room for larger conversations, um, particularly with our nonprofit. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Sanitation Foundation, but I think that might be no. a good avenue um, for you. I know um, one thing that we've done um, last year specifically really advocated for is corporate sponsored um, community mm. cleanups. And that's gone so well, um, especially in the time you know of COVID. And I don't know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, with um, illegal dumping has been on the rise. Um, thankfully, yeah. not so much of an issue in CB2, but definitely hard spots. hit in Brooklyn. Well, community board too as well, but other mm. neighborhoods really a lot. Yeah. Um, and the community cleanups have really, really helped just to kind of, again, reinforce that um, community engagement, civic mindedness, and just kind of getting people on one accord. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, to mention that, that that might be an avenue, a starting point at least. Yeah, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, Ms. Cumberbatch. Good evening. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I have signed up my co-op for um, composting. Um, however, we consist of five buildings. So I know if I'm correct, it's only one time a week for pickup. And we often have um, overflowing bins um, on a daily basis for composting, which we hold um, until our Friday pickup. Is there going to be any bandwidth to um, increase pickups? So, um, so I'll say that doesn't look likely at this time. I really wish it was <laughs> um, because um, yeah, we're just not there yet. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's my hope that we will scale uh, and uh, increase that service as well. I, actually, it's my hope that we actually end up switching the number of days for trash collection versus compost collection, but that's not up to me to decide. Um, so in the meantime, I would just suggest, you know, uh, getting additional bins from us to help hold all that material, or if possible, bringing some of that to maybe the farmer's market or for the, to your, your local FSDOs um, so that you don't have to hold all of that yourselves. Um, okay. Those would be my um, suggestions for now. Okay. Is that the kind and of thing where if we had like additional resources or district need, if we expressed a district need for, for more, um, more funding or more uh, programming in that area that we could, we, we could get a result where there's more pickups? Um, I would certainly encourage you to try. <laughs> um, okay. I, I unfortunately I can't speak for the you know entirety well, of, of the Department course. of Sanitation, but I, I imagine that, that, that would that be a would... point. I didn't mean to yep. cut Miss Cumberbatch off. Was there something you wanted to follow up on, Miss Cumberbatch? Um, yes, thanks. Um, as far as um, 
I don't know if people realize that they have to sign up for composting. I think people assume that composting is just going to resume. So is there any um, way that we can leverage, say, the borough presence office who communicates with the community or like community affairs to try and, you know, keep that information going? Because I think people just assume that compost is just going to restart and they don't realize that they actually have to sign up. Right. Yep, that's that's definitely true. It, that's an ongoing issue. Um, but we are um, always working with, you know, council members and other elected officials in order to um, to get the word out as best as we can. Um, like I said, we can only reach the people that we can reach. And so that's where uh, we sort of lean on on you guys as, uh, you know, as I'll steal a word from Jessica to be ambassadors um, for us and to, to help spread this word. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a, a volunteer program that we are now starting up. So that, that's um, at makecompost.nyc slash volunteer, which I'll put in chat. Um, and that'll sort of show you the resources that you can use to um, spread the word to folks. But we are, yeah, definitely talking to um, whoever will listen to us in terms of elected officials to get them to um, put the word out in their newsletters or invite us to events or, or host events with us. Okay, thank you. Great, and thank you. I And just for everybody else, after Ms. McKnight, I'm gonna ask for board member and member of the public uh, questions and comments. So and if you are interested in having make in raising a question, please use the raised hand feature on, on Zoom. Ms. McKnight. Okay, I'll be quick. Thank you for your presentation. And I'm just curious where you have those the pickups or the drop-offs on Saturdays at the at the uh, farmers market. Is there a possibility of just leaving a brown bin there so people in the community can just drop their things off there throughout the week? Um, so that's a complicated question, I guess. Um, I'll say a lot of our brown bins tend to go missing if they're not tethered. Um, so that that presents one issue. Oh, okay. Um, but it's also um, the food scrap drop-off sites um, aren't always processed. Uh, that material isn't always processed by us. There's a lot of processing done by our partners. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with leaving a bin out and, you know, getting maybe, you know, like 80% trash or something like that. You know, is mm -hmm. that really the best use of their resources? Is that really the best way to reach people about this program? I don't know. Are there ways around it? I'm not sure. Um, but that's just sort of where my mind goes as to why that could be problematic. I know that there was a bill last year introduced to, to have those sorts of um, community compost um, sites out separate, I guess, from food scrap drop-off sites. I don't, I'm not mm -hmm. intimately familiar with it, but I do know that there was legislation that was introduced around those sorts of things there. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ali, I see you have your hand up. Thanks for coming. Yes, I uh, very good presentation, and I was hoping that we would I would be able to attend such a meeting because I have received a letter saying that I'm on a wait list for the composting. I live on Green Avenue, so how far in advance am I going to have to wait before I actually get the service? So we actually had a, a mishap, a little bit of a mishap with some of our emails uh, that went out this past month. Um, some that were addressed to a certain areas shouldn't have been. Um, so more than likely you, uh, you'll you be getting service a lot sooner than you think. If, since you oh, live in, okay. in Brooklyn too, um, if you signed up, if we have all your information, um, yes. you will, you'll get added uh, pretty soon. I'll take down your name and I can follow up with you afterwards, maybe. Um, Should I put it in the chat? Uh, yeah, if you have your email address, you can put it in chat. I can follow up with you about okay, that. Okay, will do. Thank you. And sorry about the confusion. No problem. No worries. Thank you all for, for that. Um, it, were there any other members of the public or board members who had questions for either uh, Betty or Elizabeth or uh, Mr. Day or Ms. Cunningham? Oh, wait, I just wanted to suggest, Mr. Day, that there was a suggestion we discussed at our committee at a point last year that, that maybe we could create, have the brown bins at um, at subway entrances just because like it's a very common place that people are going to and you know clearly we got a lot of work to do to get to a point of 20 zero waste 2030 and uh, just encourage you to and you know, folks at sanitation to try to think strategically about ways that we can we can get these bins out there and maybe get them attended so that they, they don't get stolen or 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 something happens to them 
Brendan, you... Alejandro here. May I ask something? Oh, sure, sure. And Mr. Day, though, might have been might have been responding to my comment. I'm interested to hear what his thoughts were, if he, if he had any. Yeah. So, um, so it sounds like what you're referring to is are sites that we used to have uh, called Compost on the Go. I'm not positive if any of those still exist, but they would be located at like subway entrances, for instance. Um, so that was something that we had done in the past. Um, uh, unfortunately, my world is a little bit separate from food scrap drop off sites, believe it or not. So I'm not uh, entirely familiar with um, their plan of attack. I'll say, um, but those did exist in the past. Um, and so I would imagine they could come back if they're not already around. Yeah, yeah I was gonna add that in, in the past in previous iterations of this, there were community partner groups that had uh, the drop-offs by the subway, like on a daily basis, and it would be manned or a person, I should say a person would. <laughs> Men, I don't know. I, I'm not good with that, but uh, it, it would, and then it would be picked up by some uh, an organization and brought to the, a community garden or where they bring it. some of the food um, scraps are processed in Governor's Island. So if you ever take the ferry over to Governor's Island, you can observe that process, which is different than the huge site. Um, that DSNY has in Staten Island. But that's something that the advocates very much are interested in, uh, especially since the curbside is coming in more slowly than we had anticipated. People do want to drop off uh, by the subway and not worry, well, it's only Saturday, you know, from 10 to 12. Yeah. Makes sense. Mr. Varela, you were about to say something. I'd like for you to have a chance to make your comment. Thanks, Brandon. Sorry about cutting you off before, Mr. Day. I um, wanted to ask quickly, and I apologize if you said this earlier. If you did, just let me, uh, let me know. Um, <clears throat> the maintenance of the bins. We have been avid users of the bins since the program began years ago, and we are our five-person co-op signed up as soon as we were able to, and we have been uh, back to composting since the program restarted. Our the push our other neighbors actually pushed back. They said, we're not taking, we're not doing it this time around. And it was because when summer came around, it was so vile, you know, what was sort of happening inside of that bin. I mean, it was pretty gross. I think the last bin they tried to clean out twice last summer and it was so bad that they just, we put it, they put it in a big plastic bag and, and had it thrown out. Um, so we said, well, we're on it. We're going to take care of it. And my husband and I did a bunch of research and tried to figure out you know, what we need to do, the types of bags we needed, the mulch, the, all that stuff. But, you know, that takes it's a few more steps. Right. And I think there are a lot of people with still those memories of those pretty gnarly containers uh, right before the pandemic. And so I wonder if you have any suggestions or advice for um, for maintaining them and or where to go to find out about maintaining them. Yeah, so um, so some things that you can do. Um, it varies. So um, one, first and foremost, is you want to actually just line your bin, uh, like with a clear plastic liner that helps um, with the whole bunch of things um, on your end and even on our end with collections. Um, so that can help to reduce smells, for instance. Um, two, if your bin does smell, uh, you can do things like add some um, like wood chips or, or leaves, newspapers, baking soda, that sort of stuff to help absorb those smells. Um, another thing that you can do is you can uh, and some, you know, this might not work as well for you if, you, if your freezer is full, but you can actually store your food scraps um, like in your freezer or in your fridge, because what that smell is really coming from is just from your food scraps decomposing. If you keep it, you know, in your fridge or your freezer longer before setting it into the bin, that's going to really help to, to delay those smells and, you know, that grossness. Um, so putting material into the bin sooner to collect to your collection day instead of setting it out there, you know, the day after collection and leaving it for a week. Um, those are just some things that, that can help you out with the, that gnarliness, as you put it. Additionally, um, if you put the brown bit like closer to the house, then by the curb, the passerbys won't be putting in like the dog do and the uh, the horrible stuff. So I keep mine like in my area way underneath some bushes. Uh, so it's not as uh, accessible uh, to people who just use it as a trash bin. Thank you, Betty and Richard. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Day, Ms. Feibush, or Ms. Roisman, or Ms. Cunningham? 
Sorry, I have well, a question for you, Mr. Smith. Can we have this topic again in a few months and have less of a presentation or no presentation and hear more from people who have different situations, the large apartment buildings, the NYCHAs, the people who want to do it, but their landlord says no, you know, just all the different things so that we can really hear from the people in our district. That's a good question, Betty. Absolutely, we can have another uh, go at go at this. I want to keep the conversation going and we'll, we'll definitely find some time to fit it in with the rest of our agenda. The, the whole point of this is to, to try to um, raise awareness about issues like this because they're tied hand in hand with climate change and and we uh, the the focus one of the main goals of our committee this year is, is working on climate change so the um, you can definitely bank on that thank you all very much it was a really splendid presentation we're really uh, excited about the uh, Brooklyn swab organization and um, you know, we'll try and do what we can to put forth requests that will be supportive of increasing the, the efforts out there for Department of Sanitation. I think there's appreciation for that there's limits in, in to what can be done at this point, but we, we got a long way to go and we all got to pick up the pace and we got to try to do it in a responsible way. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you all very right. much. Let's move on on our agenda to our liquor license review. Uh, it's a little bit slimmed down from before, but our first full liquor license we've got is Esprit Sushi. And sorry if I messed up that name, it's 177 Atlantic Avenue. We got somebody here from that uh, location. Uh, yes. Esprit Sushi, I answer yes. Great. Yep. So you are, and I hope it's. It's messing around with my Zoom, so I can't see who you are. It's, you are Mr. Lee? Yes, that's correct. Mr. Lee, wonderful. Thank you very much. In, in just a, about five minutes or less, could you briefly describe your hours of operation and your proposed establishment here? Mm -hmm. awesome. Sorry, can you repeat again? Oh, sorry, can, can you repeat again? Sorry. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. If you can just tell us about what kind of, re of, of restaurant you're going to have, um, we, we could probably pick up some questions from there. Oh, this is Japanese restaurant. Okay. And it looks like from the information that we have, you're going to be open from 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Wonderful. And you're not going, you're going to have outdoors area and where, where's the outdoor seating in, in relation to your, to your uh, restaurant? Is it on the street or the backyard or what? Uh, uh, it's on the street. If we open, it's going to be on the street, but right now we don't, um, we don't preparation yet. I'm sorry. I, I didn't get the last thing you said. You didn't have preparation. Yeah, right yet? now we don't prepare. We don't prepare for the outdoor yet. Yes. Oh, okay. You're not going to do that yet. When do, when do yes. you plan to open? We are planning open to about two weeks. In two weeks. Okay. Great. Um, so it looks like the, the cross street is, what's the cross street for this? Cross street. Which one? Oh, this is down. Uh, this is down near uh, Clinton. It's between Clinton and Court, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Clinton. Next yeah. to the key food. Yes, 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 yes that's true. Good. Okay, wonderful. Um, how many folks do you intend to hire? Um, uh, about five or six. Okay. Uh, questions from members of the committee. Hmm. No, no, yeah, because, yeah. Oh, wait, 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 we're going to ask the members of the committee. Ms. Thurston oh, okay. has her hand up. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Thurston, the floor is yours. Are you um, taking the spot of, I'm going to mispronounce this, but Mitoshi Sushi right there? Is it the same space? It's not the same space. Oh, it'll be next to it? No, uh, it's the same place, but it's not going to be Mitoshi Sushi. It's different owner. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions from members of the committee for this application? Yeah. 
Uh, Ms. Cobb? Yes, where is the uh, restaurant located? This is Atlantic yes. Avenue between Court and uh, Clinton. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Now, just for you, you indicated that you were planning to hire some folks. Uh, we we want to encourage you to hire locally in our community. We 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 t it has no bearing on your application, but we encourage you to contact uh, uh, Ingersoll Community Center and Brooklyn Navy Yard and and some of the uh, different places out there that that have great um, opportunities for uh, people to get jobs because we we certainly have a number of folks who need jobs and hoping to see a, a, a rather diverse group of people as your employees too. Do you intend to hire yes. locally and, and, and do this? Yes, we, we have to hire the local, locally. Okay, that's yeah. great. Any yeah, questions? If, oh, go ahead. Yeah, if possible, you can send us the link to, you know, to get local folks. Okay. So why don't you tell me that, maybe. Yeah. We'll, have the, uh, we'll have the board office do that. Um, okay. Any questions from board members or members of the public on 177 Atlantic? Esprit Sushi? Mm -mm. Okay. All right. Does anyone want to put a motion on the table? Um, motion to approve. Okay. Who was who that who moved? I, I can't see the squares. Emily. Hi, Emily. Emily. Great, thank yeah. you. Do we have a second? My first motion, yay. Okay. Oh, Lindsay seconds. Congrats. Congrats, <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay with the second. Discussion on this motion? Um, okay. Um, don't hear any. Um, I'll vote yes. Ms. Cobb, how do you vote? Yes. Um, Ms. McKnight, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Nadu, how do you vote? Yes. Okay. Ms. Einhorn? Yes. Ms. Thurston? Yes. Mr. Varela? In favor, yes. Uh, Ms. Cumberbatch? Yes. And Mr. Andrews, are you there? And how do you vote? put Mr. Andrews down for abstaining unless we uh, make contact with him. Um, so congratulations, you've approved, we've approved your, your uh, application. Wish you great luck in your new establishment. And uh, uh, I hope you have much success given uh, the challenges that we, we all face with the pandemic. So um, good luck to you. Have a nice evening. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Great. Thank you. Next up, we've got 472 Myrtle, Lou LeMay. I saw Mr. Bernstein on the line. And Mr. Bernstein, will you be walking us through this one? Yes, Brandon, thank you. Um, and my clients are here. I see David Balk and Mark Roof, right? We're all, all aboard. So uh, thanks, everyone. Um, Donald Bernstein, on behalf of the applicant, this is going to be a new application uh, on Myrtle between right off of Washington it was a Mexican restaurant and uh, then was a restaurant before that. They are going to operate it as Lula Mays. Uh, Mark has been in the hospitality and restaurant business for 20 years. He's worked as a bartender, general manager, and other capacities. So it's a team that's got uh, experience. They are both from Brooklyn. David lives uh, right around the corner on Washington. The place is small. It will have 19 tables with 40 seats and seven bar stools. The maximum occupancy will be uh, 56. It will have background recorded music only. We've given you the menu. It's gonna be American Southeast Asian fair. The hours will be from noon till midnight, Sunday through Wednesday, and noon until 2 a.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, they will hire five, five employees approximately, and we'll try to draw them from the local community, which will benefit both the community as well as them as operators. We provided Carol Ann some uh, support letters. There is only one residential tenant in our building who lives above us. We've uh, provided a letter from him. He is supporting this. We provided a petition signed by a number of local residents as well. 
and also a letter from the Myrtle Avenue Brooklyn Partnership Executive Director, also in support of the application. And that is it. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, just a couple of quick questions. There's gonna be some seasonal outdoor seating. Where, where is this outdoor seating gonna be and, and what's the nature of it? And anything uh, beyond just seasonal? Yeah, it would be seasonal. Um, we would apply under DOT and someday when the city gets its act together with permanent outdoor seating, we'll, we'll have to come back on an alteration application for that and we'll see what that looks like. So there's no outdoor seating that's currently part of this application. Okay. Well, the, 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 uh, the, the application indicates 12 to six seasonally. So, yeah, I think that will, I, I don't know where the six came from. I think we'd want to keep it open till about 10 o'clock at night, the outdoor seating, which is consistent with other outdoor areas. Okay. Um, well, if you're telling me we're not having outdoor seating for now, we're going to come back, then we can take it at that or we'll, we'll come back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, maybe I misstated it. I, I didn't mean to. I think for this season, we'll apply under the DOT temporary program. Um, but going forward on a permanent basis, we would have to come back as an alteration. Okay. And for the purpose of our consideration this evening, what, what are you proposing in terms of outdoor seating? Are you, are you saying that's not before us here and we're, you're proposing no outdoor seating? Or are you saying 12 to 10 or 12 to 6? I think that we would have it under the DOT program. It would be 12 to, uh, David and Mark, did you want 10? Or yes, what, what hours did you want for the outdoor seating? Yes, uh, nine or 10 would be perfect. Okay. Was there any concern expressed from any residents in the area? None that we've talked to, no. Okay. Uh, I do we, see. We, we placed, uh, we placed uh, the, notices up um, throughout the two blocks. And um, since then have heard uh, nothing back from anyone. Okay. And the, do, the, do you feel like the folks know that you've spoken to that, because it, it seems like the uh, the Mexican place was open till 11, seven days a week. And now you're gonna go 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. for your closing times. Do, do folks know you're gonna go that late or, or uh, have you had heard any concerns about it or? There's, there's been no concerns, but we'll continue to reach out to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, we're, we're taking care of anybody's uh, concerns about this. And I do believe that the letters that we submitted and the petitions refer to the hours that we've requested. So the people that's supporting us are aware of the hours, including the resident above us. Okay. Uh, I also see you're going to rent out your place about six times a year. Um, yeah, it's not a part of our business model, but we do want the opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, once or twice a month, if, if it even comes up. So just, yeah, that's, but it's not really part of our, our complete business plan, but it's definitely something we'd like to do if, if possible, yes. Okay. There'd be a holiday party here and there. Okay. And could you just briefly speak about how that would be managed? Because I would say from, from our perspective, the biggest source of concerns that have existed in um, generally for liquor licenses beyond hotels are um, uh, private parties and outdoor seating. So pri pri private parties, uh, you know, just want to make sure that we, we have some kind of governance structure in place. And it seems like you're going to have a manager on site, but is, is there going to be a limit on the number of people? And, it, and in terms of audio, you're going to be just keeping that at background, even for the private parties? Yes, of course. Uh, background music always. Um, I, I've been an a event manager for many years also. Uh, so I've, I've handled many uh, private parties. Um, we're a small bar, small restaurant. Uh, so anything's going to be held to a, a pretty solid minimum uh, where it won't affect the, the avenue or put any stress on the neighborhood. Okay. Questions from members of the committee? Anyone on the committee have a question? Not seeing anyone. Any board members or members of the public have a question for this application? I just want to make sure the committee saw what Taya put in the chat that Zaytunes was the previous location and they used to have private parties at this location. Correct. Yeah, Zaytunes was there, I think, eight or nine years ago, and then it turned to uh, Villa Pancho, the Mexican restaurant, for about eight or nine years. 
Okay. Um, Miss Church or or Miss Miller, have we historically had complaints at this location? Not a peep. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Um, anyone on the committee want to make a motion? Ms. Einhorn. Uh, motion to approve. Okay. All second. Do we have any discussion on this motion? Okay. Um, not seeing any, I would say any condition of this, if you could amend your application to indicate the outdoor area hours are 12 to 10, uh, that's what you're proposing. And that's what we're voting on just for purpose yes. of clarity. We'll send um, that to the office tomorrow. Great. All right. Um, I vote in favor. Ms. Einhorn, how do you vote? Approve. Okay. Um, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? Approve. Mr. Varela? In favor. Ms. Cumberbatch? Yes. Ms. Cobb? Yes. Ms. McKnight? Yes. Ms. Anadu? Approve. Uh, Mr. Andrews, do we have you? Uh, still no. Um, all right. I hope I didn't forget anybody. I, I, I think it's unanimous. Um, hearing no objection. Uh, congratulations, uh, folks. Mr. Bernstein, I hope you all have a nice evening. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Good Thank luck. Thank you very much. Good night. Excellent. Now, as a reminder, the next items on our original agenda are not here, 63 Flushing and 1 Water Street. Uh, so we'll move on to 87 South Elliott Place Island Shack. Do we have somebody here from that location? We do. Hi, my name is Latoya. Hello, Latoya. I'm <laughs> okay. sorry, I'm trying to find your square. Uh, there Hi. you are. Wonderful. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, and do we have this presented? Yes, wonderful. Okay, feel free to give us some background on your place. Uh, so it's a Caribbean restaurant. It's small. It's like about 700 square feet. We have nine tables, um, about maybe about 29 to 30, maybe 30 seats, so much. Um, eight bar seats. We're gonna be doing Caribbean food, jerk chicken, oxtail, um, stew chicken, just all Caribbean. Yeah, your, your menu looked amazing. I was very excited about taking a look Thank at that. Thank you. Um, so you're gonna be open until 12 midnight, seven days a week. And just to be clear, we have no outdoor seating at this location? So directly in front of the location is um, the square, which is um, controlled by DOT. And um, I don't believe we're going to get access to that for dining. Okay. I, I believe they want to keep it public. OK. And yeah, Brandon, I don't know if you know where this is. That's a, it's that square that you, that is in front of um, where Peach's Hot House was and the um, the barbecue place. So yeah, that is that. The that's smoke joint, I, yes. Yeah, I, 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 got, I got a sense of that. Thank, thanks, Emily. Um, any questions from members of the committee? No, my question was answered. I just want to know if there'd be curry goat, and I see it. I'm good. There, there is. I saw that too. Miss Thurston? Yeah, are you open, or when do you plan on opening? So we did uh, friends and family on Monday and Tuesday. We're currently closed today, and tomorrow we plan on opening on Friday. Congratulations. Okay, and thank you. All right. I'm sure you heard the other questions. Uh, you, you intend to hire locally in, in our area? and We actually do want to hire locally. I took note of um, when you said earlier, the Navy ad. So also, if you can send a link. Right. There's also Fort Green Snap. We, we, we 
the other location wasn't in Fort Greene, but I wanted to make that note because you guys are more in that in that area. Yeah, sure. So we'll definitely get get you that information. And um, let's see, we're not going to be doing private events here. And at, at the other location that you had, were there any concerns or issues with neighbors? The uh, location in the, in the Grill Village over on Third Street in Manhattan or Clarendon Road? No, no, no issues. Okay, excellent. Um, any other questions from members of the committee, members of the board, or members of the public about this application? Let's see, where's the location again? I'm sorry, I missed that. Where is it? It's 87 South Elliott, please, on the corner of Lafayette and Fulton Street. Okay. So, are, is it also going to have takeout? Because although you may not have access to that outdoor space, people can certainly go and, you know, have food out there since they have tables and umbrellas, if I'm correct. So yes, there's a takeout window and we're mm -hmm. also signed up with um, Uber Eats and Grubhub and those platforms. Yep. Excellent. Any other questions? Hearing none, does anyone want to make a motion? Motion to approve. All right, we got a motion from no, Ms. Second. Thurston. No, second. Oh, all right. Ms. Ms. Cumberbatch, I'll give you the second on this one. I did see Ms. Cobb's hand, but I, I heard I heard you, Ms. Cumberbatch, so you get the second. Um, any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, I vote in favor. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Cumberbatch? Yes. Ms. Cobb? Yes. Ms. Anadu? Yes. Mr. Varela? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, my squares have messed around. Um, did I ask you, Ms. Cobb? Yes. OK. Yes. Ms. McKnight? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Ms. Einhorn? Yes. And one more time, Mr. Andrews? <laughs> um, he abstains again. All right. Um, congratulations. We've unanimously approved you and uh, we uh, wish you luck with your establishment. Uh, Thank you. Have a nice evening. Okay, you too. Okay. Um, before we move on to renewals, I'll just ask, was there anyone I missed who's here for a liquor license, the new liquor license that we are, are is presenting from an establishment associated with that liquor license tonight? Uh, I believe I... I have been missed so far. Uh, I thought you might have been. You what 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 establishment are you associated with, Mr. Castillo? With uh, with Clover Hill. Uh, I thought play, that uh, might be the case. Columbia place. This is why I brought this up. All right. Um, Thank you. Do we have the application? Does someone have the application for Clover Hill to present? Yeah, I have it. Wonderful. If you can put that up, Mr. Castillo, you got the floor. Do you want to tell us about your establishment? Thank you. Uh, my connection is very bad right now. I'm not in the States, so I'm going to speak a little slow just so you all can hear me. Uh, first and foremost, good night. Thank you for um, taking the time. Um, well, the establishment located to the Columbia Place, this Clover Hill, is a small restaurant. Um, it has currently 11 tables uh, and that take 26 people and then four seats at the bar. Uh, it's a very small modern American food. Uh, we'll be open um, when we fully open. Uh, we will be open from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. most days from Tuesday to Saturday. And on Sundays and Mondays, we'll be doing from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, although in the very beginning stage, uh, starting late this month, uh, we will only be open for daytime until three. And then uh, in March, we open for, you know, the whole full then up until 10 p.m. 
Uh, we do intend to have private events, but small private events such as, you know, um, private dinners and stuff like that, nothing past 10 p.m. Uh, we do not intend to have any outdoor sitting at all, um, only inside. And I think there's something to mention that I think was left out of the application. We do have a basement for storing our liquor, uh, which I think was left out. Okay. Well, thanks for explaining that, Mr. Castillo. The one thing I noticed looking through your application is that I understand there's some kind of um, residents living above and you provided a good amount of signatures, but I didn't see any of them were actually from 20 Columbia place. And I was wondering what kind of communication you had with uh, the, the folks who live there at 20 Columbia place and, and uh, um, whether it, there's been any concerns expressed about your establishment. Uh, there has there hasn't been any concerns expressed from the establishment. Uh, I noticed as well. I mean, because my business partner is the one that collected the signatures since I'm currently overseas. Uh, but uh, there isn't any concern from anyone in the building or in the neighborhood. Uh, we're you know a very quiet establishment. I mean, we opened initially uh, in 2019 at the very end. We were open for three months. We requested um, a liquor license then, which we got approved with the community board. But unfortunately, because of uh, construction uh, reasons and not being able to provide an, uh, an LNL at the time, we couldn't go through with the application. Uh, so this time around, we're doing the same thing, but no concerns from anyone in the building or, and you know, we only play background music and it's very quiet. Okay. When do you plan to open, Mr. Castillo? We're planning on opening on February 18th for daytime. Okay. And then we are opening for um, uh, dinner. We're planning late March to open it for dinner. Only two nights, uh, only two nights, and then add it a few more nights as it goes after two weeks. Okay. That makes sense. There's no outdoor seating? No outdoor seating at all. Great. Not now, not in the future. Yeah. All right. Questions from members of the committee? Questions from members of the board or members of the public about 20 Columbia Place? Hearing none, does anyone want to make a motion on 20 Columbia Place? I offer a motion that we accept. Motion from Ms. Cobb. We have a second. Second from Ms. Einhorn. Um, any discussion? All right. Um, I vote in favor. Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Cobb? In favor. Ms. Einhorn? In favor. Uh, Mr. Varela? In favor. Ms. Cumberbatch? Yes. Ms. McKnight? Yes. Ms. Nadu? Approve. Um, and never give this up. Mr. Andrews? Okay. Um, congratulations, Mr. Castillo. We've approved your application. Wish you a lot of luck. Um, and I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you very much. You too. Bye. Thank you. Great. Next up on our agenda tonight, we have our renewal applications. There are six of them. 175 Smith Street Boat, 214, 216 Hicks Street, Delaracos, Pier 6 Brooklyn Bridge Park Pilot, 1 Water Street, The River Cafe, 394 Myrtle Avenue, Chipotle, 1 Metro Check Center, Chipotle again. Um, any, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Church, have there been any concerns expressed to the board office about any of these six renewal applications? There have been none. Okay. Um, members of the committee, members of the board, and members of the public who are here, does anyone want to speak about any of these renewal applications before we vote on them? Okay, 
Um, could I get a motion from someone on the renewal applications? Motion to approve. Motion from Ms. McKnight. Do we have a second? I second. Sorry, Lindsay, I, I saw you too late. Um, all right. Um, I, I, I'm not going to do a roll call, but could anybody who abstains or votes no, please so indicate? Let the record reflect that the renewals have been unanimously approved. Great. Next up on our app on our agenda tonight is the chairperson's report. I'll try to keep this somewhat brief. Um, we are uh, sadly here tonight with uh, Ms. Church's final meeting with our committee. Um, we're gonna miss her as being a member of the board. And I just wanna thank her for all of the great things that she's done to support us with great guests and uh, just amazing, amazing amounts of energy and work from the board office. I, I think unanimously everyone appreciates you and we'll never lose you. We'll, we'll, we'll see you from time to time. You'll never be forgotten as part of this committee and you're just as much of the leadership as, as anyone who's ever led this committee. Thank you, Ms. Church. You're um, muted. Thank you. I had to be for my last meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying um, it was a pleasure working with this committee. I know it's going on record, but I'll say it anyway. I love this committee. I love the work that we do. Um, I'm not going to be far away. My work is still dealing with community boards. So you're just going to be sharing me with others. So I'll be around. And thank you for your support and congratulations. Yes, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Thank you, Ms. Church. Well, so I just want to finish on my chair report. I, I don't think it would be complete if I didn't note, I've gotten some outreach in the past month about um, uh, cannabis businesses that have been coming to our uh, community. They're not directly selling cannabis, but they're selling uh, paraphernalia or associated sorts of, uh, uh, or, uh, sort, sorts of materials. And I, I think it's a thought process that we'll have to, we'll have, to have as to where that will fit with our, uh, with our committee in the future, because I, I, you know, we, don't, we don't necessarily have liquor stores come before us, but at the same time, um, there, there are people who are concerned in our community, particularly in downtown Brooklyn about certain uh, businesses popping up. And there was even a truck apparently that was recently uh, uh, selling cannabis or, or related substance or substances or materials here. So it's something that I'm going to keep my eye on. And if, if anyone has any concerns or thoughts about it, perhaps we can talk about it a, a little later in the meeting briefly. Um, from that, I'm going to close my, my chair report with those two items of note, and we can move on to other business where I'm delighted to announce that um, Ms. Latrell Masso, who, Latrell, are you with us this evening? Yeah, I'm here. Wonderful, we're so excited to have you. Um, has created an amazing PowerPoint, which we can briefly talk about in respect of the proposed health fair. And uh, perhaps we can have a bit of a discussion and maybe even a vote about it. But the first question is who can present the PowerPoint? I have it and can do it with presenter privileges. If anyone else has it and can do it, that would be great too. Um, and I'm gonna sort of help walk through the, the PowerPoint so that we can do it, we can talk about it a little bit together. Um, who I has don't have it, but I'm happy to share it if you'd like, unless is it in the drive? I don't think it's in the drive. Okay. Um, I looped in on the email with it, Jessica, but- Oh, okay. But maybe you have it in. Maybe you have it there. Yeah, I might. Um, okay. If you're able to forward it quickly, I mean, I'm looking. Sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, now I see it. I'm so sorry. 
Oh yeah. Just, but, just when I got to the forward. Okay. Cool. I know. I'm so right. sorry. Okay, awesome. but I can definitely share this. Definitely do it. Great. Thanks. All right. So what I'm going to do, Latrell, is we go through it side by side. I'll give it a, a brief description of the slide, and then if you want to add anything extra, feel free to do that. Okay. Thank you. We're still waiting for it to load here. That's the awkward delay. Almost ready. There we go. All right. OK, great. All right, so uh, this is slide one. Uh, we are the this wonderful deck was put together by Latrell and uh, going to walk you through it a little bit. The first slide just announces what we're here to talk about, which is we're at the planning stage of a health fair. Uh, slide two, it says mask required for our, for your safety and ours. Um, and it's got a graphic on it. Latrell, did you want to say anything about this slide? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say, I have stuff I'm visually impaired, I'm legally blind. Marita helped me put this together. And we want to make sure that everybody is safe, safety safe. So this flyer that, we all must wear masks that particular day. Okay, that's a good that's a good good point. And yeah. also this this PowerPoint this is this is in research this is research so after we talk about it and then we can start the next steps so everything is subject to change. I just wanted to make that clear. Right. Yeah. I don't think any of this is like what we have to do. What I hope we can do at the end of this is just have um, maybe a vote as a committee that we're endorsing maybe the concept, but not necessarily all of the terms that are listed in here. Um, so here we've got the event outline. It states the, a few different dates, June 4th, June 18th, June 25th. The location would be an outdoor area, either Commodore Berry Park or Fort Greene Park or near the Borough Hall office with the setup time between 8 a.m. and 9.45 and an event time between 10 and 4. Anything you want to add to that, Latrell? No. Okay. One, Miss Anadu, did you have a quick comment that you yeah, wanted just to make? Yeah, just on that, we might want to think about avoiding June 18th, just because it's the day before Juneteenth. Um, and I know oh. both parks have like a lot of stuff going on on Juneteenth, so it might just to just as a thought on that. That that's a good thought. And like I said before, like nothing's going to be set in stone in here, so you know we're not committing to anything at all tonight, except just you know the concept. The uh, all right, the next slide states anticipated needs, physical space, staff, donated services or materials, electronic equipment, and print. Anything to add, Latrell? Um, can you just tell me what slide this is? I'm sorry. What number slide? Slide four. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the slide that's up next could I better explain this particular slide. Great. All right, this slide, physical space, designated outdoor public area, permits, tents, areas designated for children, stage for speakers, barriers between fair exhibits and attending general public and parking for trucks. Next slide, no comment. Okay. Um, so next we've got the, the, uh, the who, what do we gotta have in the way of, of, of people, staff? Um, Got to be some kind of supervision. Um, there's going to be somebody. Got to have somebody there as a greeter. Um, the a, a, a big concept that uh, Latrell has been thinking about is the idea of having a panel, and to do that, we would have presenters. You know, and and I think we would have one panel at this at, at this uh, at this uh, event, but but certainly we would need presenters to do that. And we'd have some exhibits where we have exhibit managers where. Uh, assigned to different locations um, to supervise setups, uh, clear ups and place signage for exhibits. Any other thoughts, Latrell? Well, um, when we first meant to talk about this um, project, that was one of the things that the committee suggested was to have a panel also. So to have people to come pick a topic and we can discuss, I just wanted to say that. That's great. Yes, I, absolutely. And I think it'll probably be something health related. Um, Want to go to the next slide? 
Yes, number seven. So these would be the kind of print materials that we would need, location maps for exhibits distributed at the entrance, uh, print materials for each exhibit, uh, large clear signage to indicate what's going on with the panel, the services, the information. And we can also share this information with the local radio station and a newspaper to also promote it. Great. I'm going to keep going. Uh, so visuals and acoustics, we would of course need to have supervision and installation of monitors and screens so that people could view this, microphones and loudspeakers, sign language interpretation um, for the panel discussion. Um, any other thoughts there, Luttrell? No. Um, so when we talk about the panel, we have to have a location and a setup and with microphones and monitors. And if we have the um, the hearing and peer community join us, we want to make sure they could be a part of it. So that's why I added the sign language interpreter. So why the um, panels being is talking, the sign language interpreter could be um, signing what's taking place. So they make sure they feel a part of everything. Great. Um, you want to go to the next one? Uh, the electronics, uh, electronic support, visual and acoustic setup and set supervision. That kind of goes along with your, your last point, right? Yeah. Yes. So we can keep going. Um, we would send a sample letter to the participants, which uh, Latrell is kind enough to have drafted here, talking about our health fair. It would be um, authored by, by me, and people could indicate whether they want to participate or not. Um, I think that's that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, want to keep going? These would be some of our potential presenters. Of course, we'd try to find. Uh, oh, Carol Ann points out we would need to get get the board chair involved in in signing that as well too. Um, so, like I said before. Nothing is committed as part of this presentation. We'll definitely take whatever feedback and particularly the feedback of the board chair. Um, we would wanna have some hospitals and institutions, Brooklyn Hospital, of course, that's our home. That's our committee, uh, our committee uh, place of, of, of normal operation. Mount Sinai and NYU, um, SUNY School of Optometry also might be other considerations. Um, and what I forgot was um, Commodore, oh God, sorry. Um, it's right there. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Um, Cumberland? Yeah, Cumberland, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Cumberland Hospital, it's right there. And it's like blocks away from um, both parks. Then we have who we're going to do outreach to. These would be um, all the different types of organizations that we would contact. And I can tell you, it's a little generic here in the side, but Latrell has done some research and she's got a lot of organizations that she's willing to reach out to. And uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed by what she's, uh, she's planning to do, but it would be churches, social, political organizations, local tenants, health and safety organizations, schools and colleges, pharmacies, radio stations, supermarkets. We will paper the world about our event and we're gonna have um, a really successful marketing, I think. Anything you'd like to say here, Latrell? No. Great. So, so for each area, a list is gonna be compiled of not fewer than 20 specific locations uh, in the area to be contacted. Um, we're gonna record all these different aspects of the organization name, the person to contact, find out what all their contact info is, and it'll make sure that we have a really organized way of, of finding the different uh, speakers. Any, any thoughts, Latrell? No. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, this would be a way we would keep track of our contacts with a contact list. Um, and community outreach contacts, members will be assigned a single area and will proceed to make contact with each of the entries on the list using the contact information and uh, will 
uh, folks will be making a, prepa a prepared statement to be used for the initial contacts. And I think by members, we mean members of the committee who'll be working with us, uh, working together to help uh, help you plan this, right, Latrell? Yes. Great. Um, community outreach contacts, uh, the, uh, the statement outlined in the goals of the project will be prepared for those making contact with some with, with some changes based on the nature of the organization being contacted. So we're not gonna contact everybody with the same blanket thing. We're gonna have a little bit of a tailored approach for, for each one. We can probably keep going. Um, these are some of the, uh, just some examples of uh, companies and other sorts of partnerships that we might have like Dwayne Reed or Health First. Um, Taj Gibson Foundation. Anything you want to say here, Latrell? No, this is just um, when I spoke to Brandon, Brandon said to make sure we have a list of partnerships. So this is just a list of partnerships that I thought would be um, to reach out to. Great. So. All right. Um, next, we're going to go into potential on-site testing. So I think the goal here is to focus on services like diabetes, vision, breast cancer, COVID testing, this kind of, these kind of different uh, uh, testing circumstances in the course of our event. Um, anything else here, Latrell? No. Great. And I think we're down to our penultimate slide, potential panel topics. Um, so these are some things that we might wanna have a panel about. We don't have to decide this tonight. This will be a follow-up conversation but we can talk about maternal mortality. We could talk about heart health. We could talk about uh, what kind of medical tests people need to have to protect their health. That might be a good topic, an event like this. Uh, how can you provide care for el elderly relatives? Might be another thing that's consistent with our missions. Anything else here, Latrell? No. Okay. I think we're at the final slide here. Um, so we'll have videos for kids, how to grow up strong, how to build your brain, um, a story time maybe from a local library using health-oriented books. It, it could be a very exciting event with uh, exposure to a bunch of people from different ages. And I think this is for the youth age group. Anything else here, Latrell? No, we have to cover every part of from the oldest to the youngest in our community. So that's why we have to have a specific area for the young for people to come with their kids. So it's not only for them, but it's also for, you know, for their children so those children can learn something also. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be great. And I, from here, perhaps we can have a quick discussion as a committee as to thoughts on, on the concept without really necessarily any of the specifics necessary, but I'm welcome to have a brief suggestion from everybody. Um, does anybody want to uh, take the floor? I just want to say it seems awesome. I appreciate how much thought has already gone into this. And um, when the time is right, I'm happy to make a motion that we endorse the concept, but we'll let others speak first. Okay. Ms. Cumberbatch. I just wanted to say great uh, presentation, Natrell. Um, I would also, um, one thing that I noted um, today, for example, is that cancer screenings are down. So that might be um, amid COVID, um, cancer screenings are down. So that might be another area that could possibly be a topic. I, I think that sounds reasonable. Hopefully we can follow up with, uh, with what the topics are at some of our future meetings. Um, Ms. Einhorn. I, I just want to second Jessica's thoughts that this is so well thought out. Um, it's really beautiful to, to see it's so organized and it's only at the beginning phases. Um, I think my only recommendation was to consider adding um, Borough Hall as a potential partner and some other city agencies, especially since they tend to come with a lot of resources um, and they could be really great partners. Okay, thanks. Any yeah. other Excuse comments? Excuse me, I just uh, say something. Go ahead, Carol Ann. Is Lindsay already giving me an assignment? Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Well, we got to we we got to You're moving across the now. street. Like seriously, <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 not going very far. I'll see you. I'll see you next month. <laughs> All right. Well, enough of that. 
Um, just because we want to be open to anybody, although I think we have lost every member of the public from, the, but if there is anyone out there in the ether from the public or from the board who wants to comment on the presentation or offer your thoughts, please do so now. Not hearing anyone because there is no one. Could someone make a motion potentially, if you'd like? I, I. Oh, hey, well, Jessica's we go, just right. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Alejandro. You have something wait. you wanted to say. Go ahead. Uh, I also just wanted to echo the the praise for Latrell. It's a, it's a fantastic presentation. Um, and as I've said in the past, I, I, I do think that a lot of, I, I think employment is a component of health. And so I just want to, uh, you know, sort of restate that uh, maybe this is the, 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 the fair in which the three or four organizations that we keep sending business owners to, we actually make a more meaningful partnership with and we invite them to the fair. Uh, because sometimes I think that uh, the advice now, it's almost like they're expecting it, but I don't know how much follow through there is. So maybe we can bring some, some just a few organizations on board uh, locally that can help us connect the, or, you know, yeah, the pieces. Yeah. Yeah, and I also four Green Snap Ingersoll Community Center, Boca Navy Yard, right? Yeah. And, and Farragut, if they have, uh, if they have, employment center. The other thing was uh, around the cancer screenings. I'm really happy to hear that. It's a conversation that I'm, I always want to have, something to keep in mind that um, almost every cancer screening and, and most, I, most screenings out there always have a younger age for people of color and in particular um, uh, Latinx folks and Black people. And um, it's about the chronic stress, you know, that sort of makes the immune response different. And so just I think also a distinction and having some education around when screenings are supposed to happen. I know that's sort of what was implied. I just wanted to underscore that. And then lastly, um, Caroline, I'm gonna miss you so much. You're amazing. I love you. I've been working with you for 13 years. I, you're a blessing to us all. And uh, I know you're gonna kill it at your next job. So that's wonderful. I'm happy for you. Uh, I wish we could have valued you even more um, while you were here. And that, But I also wanna throw um, what kind of support now, Taya, do you need from us? Because both of you were so involved in making this happen. I mean, both of you are, have been so necessary that Carolyn disappears. Now I'm envisioning that maybe you're going to have a lot on your plate. And is there something that we can or should do? Uh, I don't know in, in what ways. Like, I don't want to promise that we'll make life easier, but maybe we can. So I, I'd like to know. All right. Um, I'll go to Miss Einhorn after, but Miss Muller, did you want to respond? You don't have to. Yeah, I have no comment right now, although I do appreciate Alejandra's question. Um, but rest assured that <laughs> I will be stalking Carol Ann. She is going to be right across the street. Right. Well, we, 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 we've got a plan worked out already. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. I, I, I would echo the comments and say we're very, we, we, we feel very lucky to have you, um, even though, even, even if you were not the only one who was going to be left. But we're, we're very lucky to have you regardless. Um, Ms. Einhorn? Um, so I think that, first of all, it, all of the praise for the, the board office and, and Taya, even if you just like want to scream into a phone where someone's listening, you know, like just give me a call. Um, so um, Alejandro, I think your brilliant employment is 100% um, something we should consider. And I just want to mention that um, economic uh, development and employment committee has been trying to do an employment unemployment fair for the past three years. Um, and it's with mixed success. And so I think a partnership could support their endeavors and also strengthen this proposal. Um, and it also just gets more manpower involved for some outreach and some ideas. Um, Cause I think strengthening um, inter intercommittee work um, is always a big plus as well. We'll keep that in mind, absolutely. Um, Ms. Nadu? Um, two things, I'll try to make it quick. So one on the employment thing, totally agree. And I wonder if just even to tie it into the health fair, and I know just even the city is having a, there's a shortage of health workers. And so if there's an opportunity to bring in someone that's like some of the nursing schools or some or just anything that's even helping people to potentially get into the medical field in some way um, in, in roles that we know are needed. Um, the second thing is it's something I would love, first of all, Latrell, thank you so much for um, putting together the presentation and just all obviously all the work that's gone into it. Um, one thing that I think would be awesome to add is just 
and this may seem too basic, but just talking about nutrition, um, just because if we think about all the like diabetes and all the other things that can come as a result. And so even if it's like literally big signs that say things like, you know, one can of soda, you would have to walk around Fort Green Park, you know, 10 times to burn off that one can of soda, or just like also just what are big kind of impact things that we can do to also just put messages in people's mind and help educate throughout the event since Latrell's planned such a great event. So I know we'll have great turnout. So um, just thinking it's my marketing brain. It's like, yes, I'm imagining stuff. So I'm um, looking at anything we can do to help Latrell and I'm happy to do any side meetings or whatever you're doing to, to create this magic. Okay, well. Thank you so much because yes. I, I know Lindsay wanted to help support. And I know Monique, I spoke to Monique offline and she said that she was willing to help support. So anyone else who's willing to help we are greatly appreciate it. And Brandon said that he'll be willing. Yeah. Of course, right, Brandon? Uh, of course yeah. So you, you definitely have me involved. We, we, we will, we'll, we'll find, we will find a way to uh, pitch in and, and make sure the board office is kept in the loop too about things. So hearing all of these things, I saw Ms. Einhorn was about to make a motion, but I'll raise it again. Does anyone want to make a motion about um, uh, Latrell's presentation? Make a motion to approve. All right. Um, we're going to, you're going to prove that we, we follow the, we the, the concept, the concept. Yes. yes. Okay. And I great. know it's still under development and we're right. moving up. Yes. Okay. Motion from Ms. McKnight. Do we have a second? Yes. Second from Ms. Einhorn. I saw Ms. Einhorn's hand. We got a second. Any, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. Um, I will, I will say um, anyone who, this, who, say, who says no, we shouldn't do it or wants to abstain, please say so now. This is your moment. And with that, the concept is unanimously approved. Thank you everyone for um, your your time and thank you Latrell for uh, looking into for putting together that really amazing presentation. Can I say something? Mr. I just Smith. Say, can I say something? This is a team effort, so I want everybody on the committee to be involved in one way or another, for the smallest piece to the largest piece. So this is a joint effort. So we all have we all are one. Okay. And Caroline, you're still a part of it. You're just a phone call away. That that's right. Thank you, Latrell. And, uh, hey, thank you. And Ms. Muller, did you want to say something? I, I, hi, I just wanted to clarify. Um, you would like to present this motion to the full board at the general meeting next week? Well, I'll leave it in the discretion of the board office and the chair to figure out where it should be presented at the, at the next juncture. We, we can figure out what the appropriate protocol for that is. Uh, uh, I, I feel offline. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm happy to go wherever people want me to go and and take it, but um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see what what you all and the the, uh, the chair want to do. Um, can I say something, please, before we go that to the next level? Can we just add in what everybody's suggestions are before we? Do that make sense? If you want to make updates in the PowerPoint, you can feel free to make updates in the PowerPoint, Latrell. I, th I, I think that that's that's wonderful and it doesn't have to be the same, but let's talk offline about how we can most okay. effectively do it. I, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, anyone else have any comments or what, what was next on the agenda community forum? We don't have any community members left, but was there anyone who wanted to speak as a community member? It's just family. Okay, it's just it's just everyone. Okay, um, at this point, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? Motion from Emily. I <laughs> second. Um, any any discussion? Anyone who's not in favor or abstaining from the motion to adjourn? Carolyn, I saw you raise your hand. You wanted to motion. <laughs> what job uh, do you think you oh. just got? <laughs> Sorry, can I take back my motion so she can do the, the motion for her last meeting? She can't make, she can't can't, make a she can't I make, can't a, motion. make a motion. But I, I just want to say something before we go off. Okay. 
So you guys can vote and then tail take the tape off and I'll well, say I, 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 I don't know if I said it, but if anybody has uh, an objection to adjourning or wants to abstain, please say so now. Okay, the adjournment has been officially unanimously approved. We're adjourned.